community lawyers what's called a no code um, piece of software or an overlay to an, uh, to an application known as Doc Assemble. So who, who here has uh, heard of Doc Assemble before? So about half, literally exactly half. Uh, and so Doc Assemble is an open source platform basically that, you know, it's an original claim to fame as it was, you know, more automated doc assembly, document assembly. So you kind of, you know, take different parts of a document and kind of stitch them together and export them in different formats. And <clears throat> it was <clears throat> well done and uh, designed in a fairly modular way. And that enabled, uh, that enabled it to um, to slowly extend its capabilities. So now it's got a variety of different integrations, APIs, and cool things it can do. Like you can just plug something in so it kind of sends a fax or an email or like listens for some event on the web, uh, all kinds of good stuff. And it can do also conditional logic is probably the most important thing. So you can start to start to basically program some simple legal processes and decision trees and things like that. Um, but doing that down in um, in the code base, it just can be somewhat daunting for some people. Um, and so um, Community Lawyer provides this very simple, um, like what you see is what you get overlay. <clears throat> um, could I, can I implore someone to close the door again? And then maybe, I think it was Richard who's, ah, hey Richard, I, I know sometimes you come and go, but could you could you close the door when, when, you, uh, when you do? Thank you. All right, um, so. Scott is on. Scott is on. Great, Scott. Um, great, <laughs> so, great Scott, um, indeed. Uh, welcome, Scott. I was just in my you know, only partially informed way of giving a little bit of background about Doc Assemble and Community Lawyer, but, um, but welcome, and we're so grateful that you could take uh, time out of your busy day to, to share some information with us and to help us um, walk through and understand um, how, how to basically use community lawyer to to do a rapid prototype of uh, of a computational law system so with that, if you wouldn't mind introducing <laughs> yourself um i'd be very grateful and then um you know the floor is yours thank you yeah well th thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me to to speak to y'all really excited to uh, kind of get our hands dirty and and uh hopefully make a functioning app we'll see um but yeah, a little background. My name is Scott Kelly. I'm the president of Community Lawyer. Uh, we're a small team of about uh, four people, uh, three developers. I'm the only non-developer. I'm a. Uh, I used to be an attorney at the ACLU in Pennsylvania. Um, spent some time at the Legal Aid Society before that. But for the last four years, have been developing um, technology to empower local lawyers to kind of unlock their legal expertise in combination with um, technology. And so our, our primary product um, is a graphical user interface that is built on top of the open source DocAssemble platform that allows for, as, as Daza said, for folks who um, may not be comfortable working in Markdown and, and YAML and writing Python code um, to still take their substantive expertise, encode that in a web application and use that web application, hopefully, to deliver more streamlined legal services and help ultimately more people access um, the justice system. So um, that's Community Lawyer in a nutshell. Um, any anything more on that you want me to add before I just jump into the to, to the demo? Uh, before all of this, Chris or uh, Scott is a Kansas City in it as well oh, so okay yeah my most important attribute is that i am also from kansas uh the kansas side right brian is it, are you kansas side how does missouri side so, AC uh, Mo. oh geez oh, I I, i'm yeah. ending this demo now I gotta go. <laughs> um bob uh, has his hand raised yeah so you can just pass this along yeah. but uh i was hoping during the presentation that you might be able to uh, talk about this busy space that is Kind of expert development of expert systems in the law and how community lawyer distinguishes itself from other tools in the market. Full disclosure, we are a Yoda Logic user, but we're very interested in this space as a whole. And I would be very interested in not just the aspects of community lawyer, which I, I would like to kind of use on the ecosystem in this space as well. Uh, were you able to hear that, um, Scott? 
Yeah, just just how we kind of think of um, ourselves um, in the larger ecosystem of, uh, you know, expert system tools, particularly in the legal industry, um, and then just like thoughts on the ecosystem as a whole. Confirmed. Um, yeah, so I would say as, a, as an organization, we sort of see the two primary differentiators with community lawyer um, being our focus on uh, usability, which we, we view as sort of a, our first order problem for any expert system. It's, it's not just about, do you have a powerful platform, but do you have a sort of magically uh, usable platform? And so taking the learnings from, um, you know, outside the legal tech industry and, and, and platforms that are doing things really well, and then applying that to um, the, you know, the use case of building web apps that encode legal expertise, but that's kind of one of those things where you can only experience it for yourself. You know, I can tell you that our, our platform is usable, but it's ultimately, a, you know, just something that you have to try out and, and see how it is. Um, but I think more than that, it's, it's our commitment to being, seeing ourselves as part of a larger um, ecosystem of, of players. So, um, you know, we don't view, we're not trying to build something that's just proprietary and, and you can only use um, our tool and, and once you've used it, you're stuck with it. I mean, you can literally download the code that you, uh, that you compile um, with Community Lawyer and run that in you know, open source doc assemble. So we think that's really powerful, is the ability to actually um, you know, be a part of this larger ecosystem that doc assemble, uh, there's a couple other companies that are also building um, in conjunction with doc assemble. So, um, I'd say those are the main uh, differentiators. Um, in terms of the space overall, I think it's a great sign that there's a lot of a lot of companies that have recently launched in the space. I mean, Neotologic is I kind of I kind of thought of as the the old dog in this space, but I think Neota has only been around for about six years. At yeah. Least. So it's a young space, but I think the legal industry is finally really investing in this idea of taking legal expertise and uh, transforming it into, into automations. And, and we hope we can be a part of that story. Great, that was satisfactory. Um, one quick thing in case we don't talk again soon. Uh, Brian and I were using um, Community Lawyer as part of a rapid prototype we were doing for an automated legal entity. So we are kind of doing like the initial document generation for articles of incorporation and um, modeling um, like the annual filings and things like that <clears throat> and then trying to add on some cool stuff to do it on the web but we, we talked about this Scott and so one th little mm -hmm. thing we noticed is that when we exported the script from community lawyer and tried to import it into doc assemble when we were basically kubernetes kubernetesizing containerizing. containerizing with kubernetes uh, our whole thing to be more part of the architecture we're trying to build toward. We, it, we, it didn't work. And so we realized that there were certain code blocks yeah. that we needed to strip out of the community lawyer export in order to ingest it into Doc Assemble. So we, so you should just be aware of that. It's no big deal. Uh, uh -huh. But but maybe um, what's the best way for us to communicate that, like to give you the artifacts we had and where the code blocks were so that you can either document it or, or have a, export you know that's unique to strip the code out or however you want to deal with it like do we pull an issue in a github repo or do we you send slack. an email slack or what how do you like to oh, get probably that the best way to reach out to us is the community lawyer has a slack um we're also on the doc assemble slack but instead of cluttering that up i'd say just you know join our, our slack and um either you know dm us or just put it in general um we haven't really tried with kubernetes though very soon we're uh working with um, a platform called Rain in Court um, yeah. to offer oh, yeah. like a fully kind of um, containerized version of our system that can run on a private cloud. Yeah. Um, and that will be compatible with Kubernetes. There there be all sorts of things that were interfering, but in general, we found that folks who just take the, the YAML and run it on a sort of classic doc symbol installation running on AWS don't have issues, but we'll look into uh, compatibility with Kubernetes for sure. Yeah. What was that other? What was that other? Uh, Rain and cord. Yeah. Oh yeah, we yeah. can talk about that yeah. another time. I'll throw it in the uh, Just there's a lot of things happening in the legal tech industry. Great. Um. So thank you for for that contextualizing, Scott. And um. Yeah. So let let's we got it. We're rolling up our sleeves. We're ready to get our hands yeah. dirty. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen.
And tell me if you, if you see it now. Yep, we see it. It looks like a beautiful spreadsheet. A beautiful spreadsheet. Okay, so we're actually, this is, we're going to ignore this one for now, and we're going to focus on, on these two spreadsheets. So um, this is a super simple one, and this demo is going to be super simple. Um, but uh, you can do a lot of extremely complex things, but I just wanted to demo the, the basic idea of, and hold on a second, I'm going to turn off Slack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to take you through what it looks like to build a, a basic app with Kenia Lawyer that reads from a Google Sheet and then writes to um, another tab in the same Google Sheet. You could have it be separate sheets. Um, you could have it be a webhook to a totally um, different database entirely. So um, let me go out of here. So th this is Community Lawyer. Uh, you can sign up for a free account. We have a very like generous free tier so you can try it out yourself, to do everything in test mode. Um, you can even follow along as I'm doing this. Um, I've already built out part of this app. Um, so the way it works is it's a very you know, simple app. It just um, asks some basic questions, first name, last name, what's your household size, annual household income, and what agency are you applying to for assistance. Um, you can add different questions, uh, edit the variable names um, really easily with our editor. So you can just say, okay, I want to add a yes, no question, add it in here, add a label to it, give it a variable name, my uh, yes, no question, and, and it's simple enough. Um, I'm not going to go through all, all the functionality. I'm just going to kind of focus on this use case. So, um, but yeah, and then after it uh, gathers this information from the end user of the app, um, it uses this code right here uh, about the legal agency um, to index into a table. Um, and it pulls in, um, in this case, just the uh, multiple that they're applying to the federal poverty guidelines um, that, that represents that agency's cutoff. So for example, a legal aid, uh, the Legal Aid Society might say that um, folks who fall at uh, one point, uh, basically 125% of the federal poverty guidelines or below qualify for our services. Whereas, you know, let's say a law school modest means clinic might say that folks who uh, fall at 250, uh, you know, 250% of the federal poverty guidelines or below qualify for services. And so you want to dynamically pull in those rules based on what agency is being applied to. Um, so we've got our codes right here. And um, what I've done is I've gone over to the um, data sources tab and I've linked my app to this Google sheet, which is agency criteria. So. Um, you can see from this drop down, you can link it to a table. You can upload a CSV. Um, we also have uh, integrations with Clio, which is one of the major um, case management providers, particularly for private attorneys, um, and then Google Sheets as well. Um, so when I go in here, uh, you'll see it's a sort of a basic data transformation. So this represents the name of the uh, data as it's gonna be pulled into Community Lawyer. And then this represents the actual column headers in the table that I'm syncing to. So that I, I happen to have these names um, be the same. So agency code is agency code, eligibility cutoff is eligibility cutoff, but they give a different name. So I can add to this or change this name completely. It's up yeah. to me. So um, going, referring to the spreadsheet again, you'll see here's our very, very simple spreadsheet. Um, and it's got two column headers corresponding to the two uh, you know, pieces that are right here. So I've got agency code, which is what I'm using to index into the particular row, and then the eligibility cutoff, which is the multiple that I'm applying to um, you know, the federal po poverty guidelines. So, okay, so that's the basic idea of linking a table. Um, I can um, you know, show you how, I can you know, provide some resources afterwards for uh, exactly how to create that linkage, but I just wanted to show you what it looked like once it was set up. Um, and then I'll show you, and then later on in this demo, I'm actually going to show you how to build the integration to send the data into another um, tab in the sheet.
Um, it, I, could, I could pause for a second. Any, any questions so far? Am I, am I losing anyone or like ba basically following along? I have one little question, which is um, back in the, the sort of form maker, um, why, or if you scroll down, um, the, um, <coughs> the two um, um, data elements that are linked to the sheet are uh, purple and the others are yellow. Uh, what does that signify exactly? Yeah, so that's just uh, yellow, um, basically in our sort of scheme, represents a variable. Um, and then these, uh, in, in purple, that's just a, uh, a value uh, for a single select. So in this case, this is a drop down question. Um, so you can only choose one or the other. Um, and so we just, you know, this would output as agency applying to is LA, is MMC, uh, when, when you actually see the, the data output. Thank you. Yep. Um, and so, okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking, again, agency applying to this code, and I'm using it to index into the table. So here's the name of the table. Remember, if I go back to data sources, it's agency criteria. So I've selected agency criteria right here. And I said I want to index into that table. And what do I want to use to index into that table? I want to use, again, this code up here, so agency applying to. So that's what I've selected right here. Um, this will basically give me all the values from the table and pull it into the app. Um, and then I need to specify what kind of data type is being pulled in. So as far as um, you know, the app is concerned, all of this data is just of a type text or, or string. Um, and so we want to transform that into a number. So I've created this basic expression, which is uh, I agency from table, which is this variable right here, um, eligibility cutoff, which is again this right here, um, and we're transforming that into a number. So this is a type of operator. There's all these different kinds of operators that we let you choose from, and we're dynamically showing you the different operators you can choose from based on the data type. So that's one of the things that we're doing in the background to make sort of encoding your knowledge easier. We won't let you pick an operator that doesn't work with a particular data type. Um, we put those guardrails in place. Um, so in this case, you're transforming this piece of data into a number, and then that allows you to actually use it in this, this logic that you're applying. Now, this is some simple logic. This is just doing a basic federal poverty guidelines um, computation. So first, we have to compute what is the federal poverty line for this particular user. So I've got household size, which is the value that's collected up here, household size. And then this is just, this is just the equation that the federal government uses um, to set the 100% of the federal poverty guideline. So it's you multiply it by this number, and then you add this baseline number. That's just their arbitrary equation. Um, Interesting, like one note I'd make here is if the rule that you're using to pull that uh, using for your app is something that gets updated a lot or that you want to be able to update programmatically, you could actually be um, pulling this from a table as well. I just want to keep the, the demonstration relatively simple. Um, and then right here, now that we've defined what the federal poverty guideline is, we say federal poverty guideline times the eligibility cutoff number that we're pulling again from the, the sheet. And then we're comparing that to household income. And we're saying if this is greater than household income, um, then the person is eligible. So eligible will be is a Boolean, so it'll be either true or false. Um, so if this is true, uh, we want to display this message, yay, hooray, you are eligible. So this represents a screen that the user sees. And this is the display logic for that screen, which is display if eligible is true. Um, and if it's not, you say, darn it, you are not eligible, eligible is false. So this is some simple display logic. You can make this as complex as you wanted, um, but uh, I, I've kept it pretty simple for the purposes of this demo. Um, now, I'm going to run through the app, and then once we run through it, I'm going to explain how to now output the data from the app into another sheet. Um, so, I think someone asked a question through Zoom, though. Do I field those, or is that something that you can pick up? Oh, uh, 
we can uh, do it, fielding them as a service we provide unless you want to do it. Uh, okay. I, yeah. I mean, I, I'd be happy to answer them. I actually see them right here. Do you want me to just? Yeah. I think if you're happy to, then the best is for you to answer them as you like. Okay. Um, is there a, the ability to edit the native code directly within Community Lawyer? So Community Lawyer is sort of a one-way path. Um, you can export your code at any time, but it, it can't then be imported back into um, Community Lawyer. The problem there is it's just a huge technical issue to take arbitrary code and graphically represent it. If someone solves that, please let us know. Uh, <laughs> we'd love to be able to do it, but yeah, so you can only export, if you wanna export your code just as a note, you just go to settings, code, and um, you can go here and download the compiled YAML that can then run in DocAssemble, sometimes, unless you're using Kubernetes, apparently, so. Um, can it still worked, we just had a, it still worked fine that? when we downloaded ours, it worked perfectly fine. We just had to strip a little bit out of it to, to make it compatible. Okay. But, um, <laughs> downloading, it, it was the fact that we could download the YAML and do stuff with it is actually what pushed us over the edge to be willing to um, invest time and commitment to using your platform. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, the code is definitely optimized for, uh, you know, speed, in terms of running the app, it's not necessarily optimized for readability, but you can download it, you can modify it, you can build in your own custom CSS, your own custom API calls. Um, it, you know, so it's, it's definitely something that you can work with. Someone asked, can you link to some type of Oracle like Liber, et cetera? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with what the reference is there. Can, can someone explain that? Uh, yeah, so if you publish some kind of interest rate that changes, you know, up and down, um, and your form is reliant upon some type of variable like that. Can you API out to some type of Oracle like you would on blockchain to, you know, have a form that's dynamic and that doesn't always constantly have to be updated by like, so for example, uh, the eligibility formula you had, if you imagine instead it was like, you know, what is the weather? If it's more than 70 degrees, could you input that um, variable from the National Weather Service? Uh, or could you input like the prime rate or something, uh, you know, for a given day or, or quarter? Yeah, so that that's we're linking to like an outside, like I mentioned before, one of the things you could do is you could, you could pull in data from an outside database like a Google Sheet um, that uh, is being dynamically updated in real time. So as long as you're updating the external database that the app itself is syncing to, you can basically have variables that are changing in real time, uh, whenever updates are being made to the, the database you're syncing to. So um, that, that's definitely possible. And that, that's pretty much why we have the Google Sheet um, integration, the Clio integration, more coming down the pike too. Um, and then Alexandra asks, what are the most common tools that are developed so far by Community Lawyer? Um, so yeah, we don't develop them, but our, I, I take it to mean your user, like the users of Community Lawyer, um, the, the main use cases we see are folks who are building internal document automations for their own law firms. Um, we also see um, intake, you know, uh, or expert system kind of guidance tools for clients or people who are applying to be clients for legal aid organizations or for law firms. Um, and then an emerging category of resource that we see folks offering are fully um, DIY tools. So think of like TurboTax, but for all sorts of areas of law. So for example, we're really proud of this. Um, a nationwide nonprofit just launched that's built um, pretty much fully on community lawyer. It's called Immigrants Like Us. And they're essentially automating every um, you know, uh, individual uh, immigration form so that anyone in the United States can use their tools um, and get free, sort of basically use those tools for free. Um, and, and they're building all that out using, using our, our set of tools. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So to continue with the demo, I'm going to go ahead and- uh, I'm sorry, we have one more quick question and then we should run through the demo to as much as we can. Uh, Brendan. So my assumption is that internally you have a number of documents and then mapping this to those documents which are, are essentially contracts. So you have a, a library of contracts 
and the output is this data into the format of the contracts that you have in your database. Well, what's the output? It's, it's a contract? I mean, it's, it, yeah. I'm assuming it's a, it's a paper contract and it's not some kind of a blockchain block, uh, you know, Oh, oh you, mean, the demo will help, scale. but what product? And you should go to community lawyer and poke around. But like, you could out, you could assemble a, a PDF document, which could be a contract or a lease or a, whatever, a will or a, a notice. You could also like you know trigger a fax or an email, but you could also trigger other types of things too, like a rest a rest output to update a, a variable in a data source, which is what we're going to mm -hmm. do here. So it's quite flexible in terms of the inputs and the outputs. But the the original design of Doc Assemble was you know to was to assemble like a document in, in, in formats like Word and PDF, but it's much more flexible now. It's really data in, data out. Including modifying the clauses, if, if you wanted to change the clause? It, it, that, so watch yeah, this demo. Yeah. So the reason why we did it from a spreadsheet into a spreadsheet out is because you can extrapolate a spreadsheet into variable, into like 10 clauses yeah. of a contract. Yeah, it'd be like, uh, we want to add the, you know, liability clause for, in, you know, a new state now that we know we were operating there. So you have like an intake form from, you know, some client who exists in, you know, let's say, uh, uh, Slovenia and you need to be like, okay, we see that we have this new, uh, this new place where we're subject to liability. Let's figure out how we want to do that. And then you update it and it sends the, uh, sends that additional protection. It's, it's listed in a new, um, new data source. Yeah, so you can now add like a, a section like 10.7 B for li li liability limitation disclaimers in the state of Slovenia, for sounds example. Easier, sounds easier than shell scripts. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so the, the answer is, yeah, the, the, one of the core use cases of community lawyer and doc assemble is to compile documents. So we have an in-app PDF editor, an in-app in -app, um, Word document editor. We also have a Word add-in that's gonna be launched um, in about a week or two, which will provide even more granular control if you have highly like specific formatting on your documents. But just as a basic demonstration of this, we can also add this to our app. So here's a little Word document that I'm gonna generate. It's gonna be an eligibility determination. It's gonna be super simple. I'm gonna just create a new variable called eligibility um, sentence, right? And that doc, that is going to be, it's gonna say you are eligible, right? In the document, or it's going to say if you're not, so eligible, is false we're going to say you are not eligible so this is a very simple version um, with our word add-in for example if you have like nested lists and clauses that need to be auto renumbered we take care of all that with the you know in your microsoft word document um, this is uh you know I'll, I'll show you how this looks so uh you are not eligible um, and, uh, there we go. So I'll attach this document to the end of the, the app as well. So we can see it when it runs. So let's go ahead and attach, we'll assemble this document. Um, so we can, we can see that as well. So I'm going to run the app now and, uh, hopefully it works. Never know with live demos. Um, so, you know, you, and, and just a note here, you can, you know, this is, uh, the standard template, but you can, you know, have it do whatever you want, basically match it to like whatever, um, you know, you need it to look like, but okay, my household size is two and I make a dollar and I want to uh, say Legal Aid Society and my contact email is scott at community.lawyer. I hit continue and we do a little bit there and you can see the document was assembled. So here's the Word document. Hooray, you are eligible and open this up. Oh, did I mix that up? Um, I think I did. Uh, let's go back to my template. So I said, eligibility sentence, you are eligible. Eligible is false. Ah, there Oops. we go. So I should have said eligible is true. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was my mistake. Uh, but yeah, so you get the idea. Now what I want to show, which I think is really the point of this, is how you can also, instead of just generating a, you know, a, a static document, you can actually generate uh, data that's inputted, that's outputted. So on our final block, what we'll do is if you're eligible, we'll actually generate a new row in a sheet um, that represents maybe, let's say, a referral to an agency. 
So I'm going to go ahead and say integration. You can do just a general webhook, which allows you to send your data really anywhere you want. Um, but here we're going to use our, our Google Sheets integration. We're going to say add a row to a sheet. So we're going to select that action. And now we're going to select our Google Sheets. So computational law demo. And we are going to select the output um, sheet. And I'm going to add all the columns right here. So these are all the column headers in the um, sheet. So let me go over to that sheet really quickly. Um, output. So there we go, client name, agency referred to, poverty level, and contact email. And I'm gonna go ahead and fill that information in. Now you notice right here, we've got first name and last name. We actually don't have client name. So let's go ahead and add an expression that just combines that information in the background. So really quickly, I'm just gonna say first name and join with a space. Oh, join without a space. So join, yep, join with a space to last name. And that's your full name right here. Um, and now we can add a full name right here. Beautiful. Agency referred to, let's look that up. Agency applying to, uh, poverty level. So this is gonna be the determination of your, oh, does someone have a question? Sorry. No, sorry, um, I was clearing my, my throat, sorry. <laughs> uh, federal poverty line, um, that's just where the uh, federal poverty line is based on your household size. And then your email, because we'll want the you know agency you're being referred to to be able to reach out to you. So we're going to send all this data um, into uh, the Google Sheet. If you're eligible, if you're not, we're actually not going to send any data at all. So this is just an example. Let's run the app again. And hopefully this time the, the Word document properly assembles too. So, um, and I'm going to go ahead and say Legal Aid Society and Scott at commute.lawyers. So I hit continue. And there we go. So let's check our Google Sheet. Hooray. Okay, yes. so our information, <laughs> it actually worked. Uh, so yeah, the data was added into Google Sheet. Great thing about this is this plus Zapier means like the world is open to you, even if you don't know how to know how to code because now you can take this data and basically send it into any web application in the universe um, that, you know, that integrates with Zapier. Um, and then our Word document, hopefully this time, it actually says the right thing. Oh, yep, there we go, you are eligible. So even our Word document is correct. Now, one thing I don't have time for in this demo, um, but I, I just wanna point out is that now that we built this interface, you actually have also built an API. So you don't, people don't actually have to go to your app and um, fill in this information like I have manually filling this in. Um, they can actually, you can actually send a request with the variables in it um, and that will act automatically compute and then write the data if the person is eligible to your sheet. Um, we also have a way you can set up apps so it works with uh, URL parameters. So instead of doing a classic API request, you can just pass URL parameters. So instead of asking someone for their first name, right? And this is just, you could have the whole thing be done by URL parameters, but I just wanna show you really quickly. You could go here, go to settings, add a URL variable, and we'll say uh, first name, and uh, we'll do a, a, a test one. So that's gonna be like uh, Scott. And uh, we'll add another URL variable called last name, and that'll be Kelly. And uh, if we go back to our blocks, we can, this uh, expression is now broken, right? Because we deleted the original inputs to it, but we can go ahead and clear this out. And we should be able to now pick first name and last name right there. So now we have full name. This is still getting sent here. I'm just gonna make sure this is yep, full name. And uh, when we run this, Let's go ahead and go to settings. I'm going to copy this uh, app to my clipboard and go ahead and hold on a second. You see the parameters there mm -hmm. at the end of the URL. Yeah. Tips. Yeah. So here are my parameters. I'll, you know, we can change this. So it'll be, uh, oops, uh, Smith. And uh, we'll do uh, Sarah, right? And if we run this, it'll pass that information into the app. Um, did I still have the questions there? Let me see. Oh, I deleted them. 
Oh, I need to recompile the app. That's a rookie mistake, sorry. I gotta run the app to recompile it. Um, that's one thing I always forget. So, okay, now the app is recompiled. Now, if I paste this and run it with Bob Smith, that will get passed properly. There we go. Okay, so, um, and this time, let's say, I'm, we'll, yeah, okay, we'll do a household size of one. Your annual income is, just to show you that the logic actually works, I'm gonna do this. So, um, we'll do a request that doesn't go through. Darn it, you're not eligible, we'll go back. Um, we'll change this uh, to $10 and hit continue. And then it just went through and now this data has gotten passed right here into the Google Sheet. I didn't have to enter this in, it was passed by URL param. Again, it could also be passed by API. You could have no user interface at all and pass all of this programmatically. And that's, that's it. Yeah. yeah. That's like actual computational law right there with not a line of code. All pull down menus, you know, all what you see is what you get. It's a triumph. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a community effort. Is, uh, you know, we, we put a lot of work into this, but the Doc Assemble community, Jonathan Pyle, who's you know, the creator of that project, has done an amazing bit of work to just make this all possible. So you know, big congrats to him as well. So. Um, and I and see we, a question came in. Do we have time? I, I might be over my time limit, sorry. Um, we're, we're flexible as long see. as you are. Um, is, is Chris uh, Ferrant with us yet? I don't. In particular, if Chris isn't with us yet, we definitely have. Okay, I don't see him. So, not. yeah. So, actually, the, the so very best thing questions. to do is for you to keep talking. Um, so, uh, Michael, uh, you're on. If you could come off mute, um, please. That's, that was your that's question. right. Thank you, Scott. Um, look, just for a bit of background, I, I actually am a, a Docker symbol user. Um, I have been for the last well, about nine months or so. Um, and, and using it in our in our practice, um, which is a, a corporate uh, corporate and commercial practice in, in Australia, and I'm primarily using it for document generation as opposed to the um, uh, using the data sources. Um, probably more from a question, more to answer one of the questions of people of people in the room about like what's its capabilities. Um, frankly, I haven't found a limitation yet. Is is the answer? I, I chose Docker Assemble basically because I'd looked at a lot of the off the shelf. Uh, tools and products that are out there and in each case there was always some uh, some limitation or some area where you would um, you'd you'd come to a roadblock depending on and, and I wanted as much flexibility as possible because we're, we're basically designing apps for um, bespoke apps for our clients and in fact other law firms and um, when you when you actually don't know what the question is, you need as much flexibility as possible. And basically, the the, the long and short of it is, I haven't found a limitation. I, there is, frankly, if as long as you can, um, you, you, sometimes you've got to spend a lot of time actually just mapping out what's the best way of actually achieving something. But uh, everything is largely possible, to be honest. And um, uh, a big limitation I found with a lot of other systems was, particularly if you're limited to Microsoft Word, was formatting. And things like tables of contents and cross-referencing and particular font styles and spacing. Um, a lot of our clients will have you know, their own style guides, which you, you, need, you need to match. And uh, it handles all of those perfectly. Even th things like conditional clauses, um, renumbering, uh, dealing with cross-references within it, that's all, all possible. So uh, a, a brilliant system, and um, I, I, I can't probably can't give give it enough um, um, enough kudos, really. Here, here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's why we built our whole company on top of it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually I'm actually using the um, the, the, the document interface uh, for for a lot of our stuff, and so that I I sort of use that the no code interface there for basically for the prototyping quick builds and the simple stuff but then finesse and modify the code in the background for uh, areas where it needs to be a little bit more complex or uh, things which are maybe beyond the the no code features um, yeah. 
from a from a look at this compared to look at this system, I think you, you've probably got more of a, a more of an emphasis on the on API integrations and um, system integrations with other systems, which um, actually looks pretty cool. Thanks. Indeed. And then I think Neha had a question. Oh, ne Neha, you're you're on. Hi. Yeah. Um. Hi, Scott. I've also been working with DocSymbol for a Code for Boston project, and one of the issues we were having is making sure it's maintainable after we step away from the project. So we're trying to make sure we have automated tests built in and all that. And I'm wondering if you can speak about that a little. Yeah, so that is one set of like feature set that we're still, you know, thinking through is how to make it as easy as possible to, to test your apps. I mean, one of the nice things about building in a no code tool and also one of the limitations, of course, is that it has those guardrails. And so we do try to do a lot at the front end to make sure that uh, your code is runnable. We do a ton of runnability checks um, and just make sure that, that things are gonna compute. But in the future, you know, ideas we have to improve um, the ability to maintain apps. Um, one of them is programmatically generating um, sort of the, uh, basically associations from one block to the other um, because we already do that in the background to check for like infinite loops um, so it's just a matter of like graphically representing that um, so instead of having to create your own decision tree you can actually just run your you know run this tool and, and it'll essentially uh, programmatically generate that uh, decision tree um, there's also some great off the like shelf tools that you can use for testing so um, if you haven't tried it out um, there's a chrome plugin called selenium um, that you can yeah. use to um, just basically create click, you know, click throughs of apps. It's a little brittle, but um, click throughs of apps that uh, can test your apps and um, you, you can have expected outputs. And if it deviates, you can set in place alerts. Um, another thing that we've really found valuable is uh, there's another plugin. Let me see if I can remember the name. It's called, what is it? I don't even know what the name of, oh, form filler. There you go. And you just mash the button and it fills in all of the, the fields in a particular screen. So it allows you to go through screens really quickly. Um, it's not 100% it's not automated, but it definitely speeds up testing. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, we've been using something called Lettuce so far, but I'll check out these two as well. Yeah. Great. Um, and uh, we've got uh, two more questions. Uh, I want to go to Michael first, just because he said he raised his virtual hand first, and then Bob. Uh, thanks, Daza. Look, also also on the testing front, um, I find probably the most time-consuming component in the testing front is, um, look, I, I'm primarily developing, I guess, with Word in mind, and so I start with a with a Word document, usually like a say a quite a long um, quite a long contract, and testing um, testing does become quite time-consuming where you do need to complete variables, and um, my process at the moment is usually. Sort of test as, test as I go and um, error find as I go. The process that I use um, at the moment is to have a, um, I've basically just created an app where I upload a variable list, which is just a YAML file, which has all of the variables declared as a, in a static form. So you don't need to input them each time. You can just have them as basically some dummy, some dummy data and use that to, um, populate your document as you go but um i was just wondering if, if, if you or anyone else in the room has actually come across any other tools where you could actually say visualize uh visualize a word document or uh something similar whilst whilst working and um uh as a, as a back as a taking a step back in before i started using doc assemble um i was looking at um use it, looking at markdown and r markdown and which the, I'm not sure if anyone's ever come across it, but the, the um, integrated development environment for R, um, the R programming language has a, a feature where you on one side you can have code and the other side it shows the output in Markdown. And a tool like that would be incredibly valuable for something like DocAssemble or um, where you, you, could, you could generate it live. I think it's incredibly complex to build, but um, would be, really, really useful in the build process. Uh, so yeah. if, if anyone's come across anything, that would be that would be amazing to hear about. Yeah. 
And yeah, I would just say um, we thought about that, like a preview screen, and, uh, and very much possible with our PDF editor. I think we'll, in, you know, probably in the next year offer that. And for our in-app word editor, um, where it gets trickier is when you're talking about like actually visualizing documents that are just in Microsoft Word, and that you might be like marking up using a sidebar or just using Jinja. Um, obviously, that requires essentially like in your web app hosting a version of Microsoft or like very quickly retrieving documents again and again and again. So I, yeah, if someone could develop it, it would be amazing. I think um, that that is uh, a little bit further away and, and not presently on our roadmap. Um, Good. Uh, we've got um, two more in the room and I see uh, Chris Barrent is on the line. So Chris, uh, well, we if, you, online too. if you That's would, um, if you would, uh, do you mind indulging us to uh, allow the uh, Q and A to go a, a few minutes uh, longer. Oh no! Please uh, take the time that you need. Th thanks so much, Chris. Um, so I think it was uh, oh uh, Richard, Bob, and uh, Megan. and Megan, and then uh, we're good. And R Richard, I think you have priority of like just physical presence. Okay, so um, zoom a little further. Perfect. <clears throat> Technical document systems capable of doing complex document assembly applications with a lot of uh, database support, rule bases, and all that was uh, was done in the late 80s. It was not new. It's just been abandoned in favor of the steaming pile of things like Microsoft Word. A good example was built at MIT, spin out an MIT spinoff called Interleaf. Oh, yeah. I've done, I've done ten to fifteen thousand dollars, fifteen thousand hours of work developing such applications. I built a full document assembler that built all the prospectuses for one of the largest mutual fund companies in the world. It ran for almost twenty years. So the technology exists; nobody wants it, and uh, it's been replaced by JavaScript and things like that. It would have to be rebuilt, but this is. It is not true that it, it wasn't built. It's, it got rolled over like a steamroller. Yeah. Because uh, for a long time, people didn't believe they could do this kind of automation. And I built dozens of document assembly systems, and some of them were for legal documents, including regulatory documents. That's what I did before I went to law school. Beautiful. Yeah, uh, so true, and I, I can think of time, oh, I'll grab it, um, in the, um, you know, oh God, maybe like 10 or 15 years ago, uh, you know, Documentum? Yep. Yeah, so oh, like there was right. humongous. Right. Well, that's, um, document, that's document management. Management, but, it, but there's a big document assembly kind of, it does a lot of things. And, uh, but something that, uh, that I think is worth mentioning is um, now that there's been more of a sea change, especially in the law toward, you know, more apps and, and services, there seems to, there's a, there's a new, it's a new era and there's more readiness to adopt document assembly. There's more players out there in the market. And then the thing that's interesting about Docus, DocAssemble is, um, is that it's open source and actually has a reasonable community of diehards uh, that have been using it, building it out. Now we've got this ecology um, starting to emerge like Scott's company with community lawyer doing like no code overlay on it. And um, so there's, Something I, I think if you haven't actually poked around the doc assemble site, uh, I strongly encourage you to do it based on your background and take take a look. Um, but yeah, it's it's hardly the first, and and in some ways it's it's you know more limited than you know some of like the huge um, enterprise um, you know behemoths that, that are that are out there. But it is unique in certain ways. Partly and part of what's so interesting about it being open source is that it it very much supports and reflects the the felt de demonstrated needs of the community that's been building it up so it's been um, developed hand in glove with use cases that people care enough about to invest in and then to reuse and extend and expand um so we and it also is way easier to kind of do further development precisely because it's open source you can get into the github repo and the slack channel and and uh, and see other people that have done stuff like what you're interested in. So there's something about the open source aspect and the fact and, and the point in history that it's hitting that I think make it potentially a little different. So one thing you can't do is you can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's just the fact that you can't. Thank you. One thing you can't do is you can't um, overcome the lack of of uh, queryable document structure in Word. Right. Because Word is a joke. 
Um, so to some degree, to the extent that you could do that in uh, JSON, I mean in Java, in uh, the, uh, uh, the DOM, yeah. in JavaScript, yeah. and do it with more modern technologies, you'd be overcoming it and then shadowing out to work. Right. And uh, good document uh, composition systems. This problem has gone back all the way to Knuth and how people lay out LaTeX documents and do all that. And in the real world, the quality of the documents matters a lot. And also, when you file documents with the court, and even though those are very simple, they still need to comply. Mm -hmm. So the, I think all the arguments you made about what people want are completely valid, the right use cases. Um, that's completely valid. But I will say that if uh, the technology for actually rendering the documents uh, created a different level of burden, mm. the things that became feasible to do and automate would appear different. And Word is an extremely destructive mm. standard for that because Word is non-portable, yeah. baroque, unstable. Just go down the list. We could spend the rest of the class adding. Yeah. So adding, I, I agree with you, I agree with what you're <laughs> to that word. I do agree um, with what you're saying. Yeah. And then and partly and I agree with what you're saying too for the record. And part of the reason why we asked Scott to build the demo around the, all the document assembly and the and the legal logic around getting data from an arbitrary source, which is Google Sheets in this case, and then sending data to an arbitrary source is precisely to demonstrate a world well beyond not just Microsoft Word, but beyond the concept of a document paradigm and going to a data paradigm. Hallelujah. Bob, you're up. Hey, Scott. Um, so at Liberty Mutual, one of the things we're thinking about all the time is how we might be able to monetize our uh, work. Do the and different so screen. I was wondering, in, oh, sorry, this way. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right, cool. I have my back to you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're thinking about monetizing our work. And um, so I was just curious, you know, with a name like Community Lawyer, right, is this something where you make like people can make their applications available to the community or do you have a future uh, kind of vision of starting an app store if you will where you could I could create something in-house with my no code folks that's kind of smart and slick and does something you know kind of creating the law in, in a very digital way and then license it out to others that might want to use that same application Perfect. yeah so I, first of all, I, I think you're the, one of the very first people who has recognized the, I mean, at least explicitly recognized the connection between what we do and our name. Um, <laughs> we're very, we were very, very interested in this idea and, you know, borrowing from the software world itself and what, you know, what you see in GitHub is the folks are, de they develop software, they publish it openly and others can leverage it. Um, we think a very similar ecosystem can be set up around legal knowledge. And so we've developed a uh, really robust architecture for uh, folks to not only build apps, but then share those apps and permission the sharing of those apps um, with other people who are users of Community Lawyer. Um, so just really brief preview. You can go here, you can set up your own private or public communities where you publish your apps. <laughs> then you have granular control over you know, what you're publishing to. You know, here's my law firm subscriber community. And then you can actually determine you know, how folks can run those apps. So maybe they can just run the apps. Maybe they're allowed to copy the apps that you built. Um, you could then decide what kind of copying they can do. So maybe they can duplicate it, meaning they can see exactly how it's built. They can take it, modify it, do whatever they want. Or maybe they can just subscribe to it, meaning they don't see the underlying architecture, but um, they can maybe change a few things like the name on it, the branding, and they can know that a trusted team is behind the app and is modifying it and updating it. And so you can, you know, offer that for free. You can open source it. You can also make a proprietary offer, uh, you know, charge a subscription. Um, you could charge a uh, one-time payment. Um, yeah, we've done a lot of thinking around that. I'm happy to uh, point you to some resources or, or send them as a follow-up um, that, that explain how to do that with our tool. Uh, it, could, we, could we suggest that, uh, I don't think Brian or I have uh, access rights right now to the app, but could, could you go ahead and, and share, the, share the app that you demoed today and then we can send the link around to people yeah. so you can start to get a sense of, of um, how they support that natively in Community Lawyer. Yeah, that would be great. We could post that yeah, in so, her repository. Great. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll share the app. The one thing I'll do is I'll, I'll change it from reading and writing to a Google Sheet. 
to reading and writing to uh, like a, a table and then just sending, sending a webhook. Because when you have a link to a specific Google Sheet, you don't also have access to the Google Sheet. It's, it's not a very helpful um, example. So, yeah. That, that would be awesome. Uh, and I think we've got two, two, two more. So if we could maybe make them sort of quick, uh, and then and those will be our last two. Uh, uh, and so uh, I believe it's uh, Neha and then no, was it Megan. Megan? Oh, it's Megan. Megan. Okay, so one more. M Megan, uh, what, what is your and question? Sam. Oh, Sam. Oh, Sam had a question about uh, potential uh, localization to Portuguese. Uh, but first yeah, things I, first. I answered that silently in the background. <laughs> oh, so very good. I think Sam saw it, yeah. We basically uh, have different uh, translations of all the hard-coded like buttons and things like that. Um, and that's not something that we, we've developed. That's just our, like users of DocAssemble. They'll create translation files for different languages. Those will be incorporated into DocAssemble and then we just can link to those. So one of our users actually created the French uh, translation file. Um, and now it's a part of DocAssemble and now it's something that everyone can utilize. So the beauty of open source, right? Indeed. Uh, Megan, you're, you're up. Hi, um, thank you, Scott. And um, I'm sorry about the background noise. I'm actually um, kind of stealing Wi-Fi at a cafe right now. <laughs> um, so um, obviously the demo that uh, we walked through was intentionally simple. Um, but my question is more about what happens if those types of questions to get the final answer were not Boolean, for example. So. Have you ever heard any opinions or those who've built apps on Community Lawyer, um, if they've communicated how they work through some potential issues with definitional challenges, what happens? Because obviously in the law, there could be dualistic meanings or there could be space for interpretation. And I'm just wondering if you've ever had sort of those who did try to develop an app who struggled with you know, kind of finding which definition or if they've ever actually had to actively make the decision, like we're going to fix, this is the definition that we're going for, for example. If Got it, and, and, and could you give an example, like an example of uh, maybe a, a legal issue you're thinking of where, where this issue arises, just so I can kind of like be more concrete about it? Um, I guess for, um, I'm thinking maybe in the area of torts where it has to be incredibly facts specific. Um, and it, it's not necessarily just like a computation of like the household size and maybe like the poverty level, but it's more on what specific, I guess, small nuances in, for example, injury. And mm -hmm. if that makes any yeah. sense, or if it's just limited to certain fields that people are using um, community lawyer right now. Yeah, so we, we actually have users who have do like really complicated triage apps that like are you know meant for it's meant to be like i forget what city um is using it right now but there's one city that basically a bunch of their legal aid providers came together and they developed a triage system where all their different complex guidelines for whether you qualify or not not just household size household income just like things like are you over this age um do you need help in this particular issue are you a military veteran can all be combined um and yeah, it can get complex, and and that's one thing we always you know tell people is we can we we say it's no code, but it's it's not no logic. You know, um, you, you definitely the the hard part of all of this coding or not is specifying, and so the ability to really sit back, specify properly what the definitions of particular eligibility buckets are can be really tough. Um, and we definitely are happy to work with users to think about, think through the app architecture. One thing I can't emphasize enough is just clear naming of variables and having variables represent concepts. So for example, this is just a really small example. I could have combined all of this into one expression. Um, so, but I wanted to make this more readable. <coughs> if you just seen household size times this plus this, and then is it greater than household income? you wouldn't really be able to look at a glance at the expression and understand what's going on. And so what I did is instead I assigned a, a variable called federal poverty line. And then that way you can actually read what's going on here. So that's one of the things we emphasize with authors is make sure each variable that you're using represents something um, that, that is you know, linked to a concept and that'll make it easier to kind of have the center of your app hold and not sort of completely break down. 
Great, thanks very much. And if I could offer a little perspective, just based on the, what I imagine you may have been um, thinking about, like where does this fit in, in the law overall um, and, and what, what's computable. So in torts, like the, the implied context of the question is if, if you have a slip and fall or something, can you compute what the legal result would be if it were tried in a court or something like that? Um, and th that's obviously fa subject to many, many, many factors, factual, legal jurisdiction, what lawyers, what judge, what day, um, on and on, the, the nuances and facets of the type of injury. And so like this, I don't think at this point, this is intended to be sort of like this will solve every aspect of law, uh, including like coming up with predicting the precise result of litigation. But there's certain places where this is a great fit now. So if you're a torts lawyer and someone comes in with that same slip and fall, you have an intake form and you may ask them, you know, 50 questions about the nature of the industry, uh, the injury, where is it at a workplace, how old were you, you what did the doctor say, on and on, how many months, and then, you know, there's some, there's some, uh, tort, there's some plaintiff's lawyers who can, who know very well, like if they ask these 20 questions and get the, these type of ranges of answers, they can say like, ah, that's going to be like a hundred and thirty to one hundred and seventy thousand dollar recovery, very likely in this jurisdiction under these circumstances. So, like, you could start to compute some of that type of stuff. It's really good fit, but if you know how what the variable should be and how to compute that, so forth, so that you could then get them into into an intake and a representation letter and go. The judge at another point in the life cycle of this um, hypothetical context could like the clerks could actually potentially put together a lot more parts of the opinion as part of like a way to write the opinion. You could, the lawyer after the representing could, could start to do the complaints and the depositions a lot faster. Uh, all, so like the doc assemble right now is really key to those sorts of, I'd say like slivers of the law, but not necessarily like, like the, you know, like there's many aspects of the law, like your you know, torts and constitutional law and human rights and, you know, ideas are like principles and values, which are much fuzzier and maybe not like the primary use case for doc assemble and community lawyer. Is that, is that fair to say, Scott? I think that's definitely fair to say. Um, yeah, I, I used to be a constitutional uh, lawyer and I would have had no use for a community lawyer. So, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I say that a bit facetiously, but yeah, there's definitely areas of law where there's too much ambiguity um, and, and maybe, you know, illogical sort of opinions across time and space that really wouldn't compute, right? They would break the computer. So uh, that's, that's where the humans come in. Um, yeah, I just, one note I want to end on, I see a quick question about this. And yep. just in general, if you want to learn more about Community Lawyer, you can go create a free account, start building, um, you know, have at it. Um, you can also go to the help guide tab and you'll see a number of different resources. Um, you can go to the, you know, like everything from the tutorial to getting started, which has a lot of different resources to our very in-depth user manual and, and video library. Um, if you want to look for one place to start, I'd say try this tutorial right here. Um, it walks you through like a very simple app and kind of has like different, um, they're almost like lessons, right? Um, and uh, I, I saw there was, you know, someone asking about a class, definitely reach out to us. We, we've worked with a lot of different classes to come up with uh, curriculum and uh, would be happy to help with that. So. Awesome. Um, so with, with that, thank you so much, Scott, yes. for taking the time and, and really, you know, again, MIT does not endorse private companies or products, but I just want to say, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the quality of what you've done and, and, and the way that you've done it is, is really inspirational. And it, it was, uh, I think, you know, in addition to being so incredibly useful in the field and in practice, it actually serves the purpose of explaining what we mean by computational law, yeah. at least as part of it. And, um, and so just, you know, kudos and thank you very, very much from the bottom of our hearts. Yes. Well, well, thanks for having me. It was really fun, uh, you know, spending some time with you, answering your questions and, uh, Hopefully we can keep the conversation going. Um, yeah. so see you. Let, let's please. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Bye. So that we, we should do that the first day from now on. Yeah. Um, instead of the last day. Um, but uh, with that, um, so now that you uh, have a, a concept of some of the nuts and bolts and mechanics of how this stuff could play out, um, l let's take a look at one of those more complex potential scenarios of like what are the 
at the top of the, your game, what are the sorts of things you could do uh, with the, with this sort of way to compute um, legal processes mm -hmm. and instruments? And um, and that's why we've asked Scott Barrent to no, join Chris us. Barrett. Oh, excuse me, Chris Barrent. I'm still thinking about Scott. Chris Barrent to join us again this year um, to to show us um, some of the um, so, so, some of how to. To how it's possible to begin to deliberately engineer and structure transactions in order to uh, have a better chance of achieving certain desired legal results mm -hmm. to fall under certain legal uh, regulatory frameworks. So that's a type of engineering. Um, we just saw some engineering tools. Let's take a look at uh, the types of systems that we could design and engineer um, computationally uh, with Chris Barrent. So Chris, welcome. And if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, especially your sort of evolved, um, I guess I would call it, um, uh, uh, role and, and uh, affiliation, uh, and, and then um, and, uh, and, and feel free to dive right in. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks, Daza. And um, uh, I apologize, I apologize, folks. I've been a little bit under the weather the last two days, so um, I'm not subjecting you to the video feed. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I have a face for radio anyway, so you're not missing much. Um, I, my name is Chris Barrent. Um, I am a uh, transactional and regulatory attorney. Um, I work, work mainly uh, in the clean energy and sustainability space. Um, I build, um, I help clients build uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, renewable energy um, uh, facilities, power plants, uh, biofuel facilities, cogeneration facilities, microgrids. Um, uh, also do a lot of transactional work on the uh, energy commodity side and do a ton of work in the environmental markets. Um, uh, their design, their formation, how environmental instruments uh, and the rest of it get originated, transacted, um, uh, and so on. Um, I'm here today to talk about um, structuring um, the way that you implement a business enterprise uh, to uh, achieve the regulatory treatment that um, uh, that you desire. And it's fairly safe to say that um, for the most part, the regulatory treatment that most folks desire is a light regulatory treatment um, uh, uh, and one that's not burdensome or, or restrictive. Um, so um, uh, we're gonna talk about a few things today um, I'm going to tell a little bit of a regulatory story um, uh, in terms of intangible commodities, but um, this discussion is going to come around um, uh, to how fundamentally you look to structure the design and the governance um, of an enterprise blockchain um, and the characterization of the digital assets, um, the coins, the tokens, the instruments, and so on, um, that uh, that enterprise blockchain is using. Um, so uh, let me start out. Um, uh, uh, did everybody hear the riddle? Yes. Uh, Some people did. I know. We have one hand raised. One in hand. The room. Well, I, I will say the riddle again, and uh, and uh, we'll give folks a chance to 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 take a guess, and if they've done the reading, to take a very uh, sharp guess. At, um, uh, at what it means. So the riddle is this. What things are alike because they have nothing in common? What things are alike because they have nothing in common? Any guesses? Anybody? Um, you feel free to type online if you have a guess or raise your hand in the, in the room. Uh, we have one hand, uh, Brendan Marr. Contracts? Contracts, uh, in, in, in what sense? In the sense that every contract is both the same and different. Okay, in the sense that every contract is the same and different. Um, adjudicator of the riddle, what do you say? <laughs> uh, it, that, that's close, it's getting there. Um, uh, any other guesses? Oh, people. Um, the, 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 think about this: a, a contract is a way that a thing gets that a thing gets transacted. But what is the thing? What is the thing? Things that are alike because they have nothing in common. So, Alexandra online suggested money. 
money. Yep, that's, that's close, but I can take a dollar out of my pocket and hold it. Any other guesses? Value. Value, Value yep. says Bob. That, that's getting much closer. So um, the, the answer to this question um, and the trick of the riddle is that nothing refers to corpus. Does something exist in tangible reality? Does it have body? Does it have corpus? Um, and in this instance, the things that are alike because they lack corpus would be a carbon offset or a renewable energy certificate, um, environmental instruments, um, environmental commodities, and digital assets, a token, a coin, and so on. Beyond the electrons that are in a position on a transistor, you know, in a computer or database system and so on, those are all things that exist as a concept, as a record, and so on, but they don't exist in corporeal reality. They don't exist in physical reality. And the reason um, why this became important bears on what has, we've been able to emerge as a new class of things, quote unquote, um, which are intangible commodities and more specifically environmental commodities. So that brings us to the story. Um, back when Congress was reacting to the credit crisis um, and passed the Dodd-Frank legislation, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission was looking at what should be included in all of these new rules that require for people who are transacting in financial instruments like credit default swaps, um, uh, uh, what they were looking at what new rules were appropriate to require the maintenance of collateral accounts um, and other protections so that someone wouldn't get in a position where uh, so someone wouldn't get in a position where uh, they found themselves um, you know essentially having um, uh, uh, created a, a, a loss that they can't cover um, uh, you all might be familiar when you, if you've seen ads for options, futures, other derivatives, um, it'll say something along the lines of warning, you can lose more than you invest um, in this investment. And that's for a very good reason. So what we saw happening with Dodd-Frank was this reaction to the credit crisis, um, the Wall Street Reform and Protection Act, the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, and what happened was the CTFC came out and took a look across the various markets um, and looked at the environmental markets. And these are things like renewable energy certificates, admissions allowances, carbon allowances, um, and the like. Um, uh, environmental instruments as a general um, uh, uh, a class of instruments basically represent one of two things. They either represent activities that occurred that improve the environment. So for instance, renewable energy certificates, every one megawatt hour of power that I produce from a solar array or a wind farm or other renewable energy generation source creates actually two commodities. First, it creates the actual underlying electrons, the power, but then it also creates one renewable energy certificate for each megawatt hour of power that's produced. And that, may, that renewable energy certificate represents all of the green attributes, all the green claims to using green power. So if that wind farm sells the power to one entity and the renewable energy certificates to another entity, it is the entity that is buying the renewable energy certificates, matching them up with the power that's called gray power that they're getting off the grid, basic power and so on, and it's that entity that bought the renewal energy certificates that's able to claim that they're using consuming green power. The entity that bought just the electrons off that wind farm has no claim to buying power from a renewal energy facility. Instead, it's what we call undifferentiated energy or gray power. It's just power like any other electron on the grid. Um, and renewable energy certificates like carbon offsets, carbon allowances, emissions, 
um, allowances and so on, um, have both compliance markets that are governed by regulation, um, as well as voluntary markets that are governed by standards bodies that create um, various standards protocols and so on for projects um, to use to originate um, environmental instruments like RECs, um, like carbon offsets, and so on. Um, renewable energy certificates, carbon offsets, and so on are a very important revenue stream to clean energy projects, sustainability projects, whether you're talking a wind farm, a solar array, or if you're talking reforestation of, of millions of acres. Um, uh, 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 there's a whole range of different environmental market projects that can be done, uh, but those projects um, are, for the most part, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, significantly reliant um, on the value they can get from selling the environmental instruments that they originate. So let's go back to Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank is basically saying, hey, all of you guys who are transacting in financial products, financially settled instruments, i.e. when the final sale takes place, money goes one way or money goes the other way. They were basically saying, that's created a problem. Dodd-Frank is going to fix this by requiring things like better collateral counts, better disclosure, uh, and so on, to be able to trade in those so that we don't have a cascading um, you know, crash like what, what happened with credit default swaps. The, the, what the CTFC asked, though, when they looked at environmental instruments like renewable energy certificates, carbon offsets, and so on, was, hey, wait a minute. Since these instruments don't exist in corporeal reality, since they lack corpus, can we treat them the way we treat other basic commodities that can be <coughs> settled? And again, I'll give you an example. You can have a contract, a forward contract, to sell someone a bushel of corn. When that contract requires delivery, I deliver someone a bushel of corn physically, they physically take possession of a bushel of corn and they give me money. That's different than say corn futures or corn options, um, derivatives that use the price of corn as physically delivered in the market, on the spot market and the forward market as the underlier. But look at that just as a price mark. And when those contracts come due, Instead of something physical going one way and cash coming back the other, cash either goes one way or the other, nothing physically gets settled. That's why we refer to derivatives as financially settled instruments. And the Commodities Futures Trading Commission basically was established to have jurisdiction over financially settled instruments, financially settled commodity-related transactions. And in, in establishing that jurisdiction on an exclusionary basis, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission does not regulate physical transactions um, in the same way that it does financial, um, other than just making sure that things like commodity pool operators and others are doing what they need to do from a registration standpoint. But if you undertake a physical commodity transaction in the agricultural markets, in the energy markets, um, of widgets, you name it, right? Um, uh, any type of commodity, um, you, uh, and you physically settle that transaction, you are for the most part avoiding Commodities Futures Trading Commission regulation. And importantly, under Dodd-Frank, you would be avoiding the need to establish collateral accounts um, to, to park money aside to cover your position and the rest of it. So we're getting into the, the forward contracts exclusion now, right? That's right. So, and this, and this is an example of when you said earlier, that, you might want to structure that, that, a transaction to be correct, lightly, yeah. lightly regulated. Then one way you could do that for commodities is to is follow up is to number one, say, make sure everything is related to commodities. Number two, further refine it so that it would fall under the forward contracts exclusion. So just, that's to, right. just to sort of the, bring the it down. C, for a the CTFC has what's called a safe harbor <laughs> that you can avail yourself in if you are partaking in a commodity transaction where there is physical settlement of the commodity. If you fall in that safe harbor, you don't have to comply with 
the same type of rules, things like maintaining collateral accounts and so on, that you have to uh, do if you are undertaking trading of a derivative that is financially settled. And so what happened when Dodd-Frank was passed, the CTFC began to take a look. Um, and DAZA is, if you just, um, uh, you know, uh, a word search for a contract, you know, exemption that should come up or safe harbor. I'm trying. Um, oh, yeah. And you want to know what? Because it's displaying a PDF, it's not treating it like data, and therefore it's not no. displaying it like normal data. And so therefore, I just wanted to say that out loud because I hate that. Yeah. And now uh, we're going to go to my desktop and uh, that, that's fine. data proprietary app. Yeah. Again, because it's not data. And, we'll, and uh, just give me one second. But I, I, I will find that, that clause. Sure. And I don't expect everyone to read the full final CTFC rule. But ultimately, in, in the, this final rule um, by the CTFC, um, uh, they defined what a swap was. And if you were a swap, you were a derivative, you were financially settled, and therefore you needed to, um, you needed to basically, you know, work in accordance with all of the rules um, uh, for financially settled agreements. Um, what the I, I've, I've got it up now, by the way, just yeah. so whenever you're ready. There we go, sure. Um, uh, and, you know, that again, something to peruse. You don't certainly have to read this while I talk here, folks. <laughs> what the CTFC asked when they started the rulemaking, which drove the environmental market community, the renew especially the renewable energy uh, uh, project development community, uh, batty, was they said, well, wait a minute. If a renewable energy certificate just exists as a record on a database system, and it doesn't act actually have corpus in physical reality, how can that instrument be physically settled? And what we had to do is go in and describe to them the ways in which environmental instruments are indeed physically settled. Um, in other words, they get directly transferred upon delivery, it's, you know, in exchange for cash, they can be retired and consumed for a purpose that cash cannot fulfill. Um, in other words, I can use a rec to claim that I am procuring this much green power. I can't do that with a dollar bill. I can't do that with cash in the bank. I can do that if I have a renewable energy certificate that I retire to substantiate that claim. Same thing if you are trading a emissions allowance as part of a, uh, a carbon market, if I am trading a compliance admissions allowance that gives me, that carries with it the right to admit one metric ton of carbon pollution into the atmosphere, um, that if I didn't have it, I would otherwise have to pay a penalty um, uh, if I admitted it, um, that allowance is serving a purpose that cash cannot serve. Um, and so what we basically did is we demonstrated to them how even though environmental instruments are intangible, they still have all of the characteristics of commodities. They can be physically settled, they can be physically transferred, they can consume, be consumed and serve a purpose that cash cannot serve, and they are not derivative instruments. They're not based on any underlying activity. Um, they, their value changes with the value of that commodity in the commodity market not because there's some different underlier that they're linked to that's shifting like derivatives. So we were able, for the first time, beyond rifle shot pieces of legislation like Title IV of the Clean Air Act or renewable energy portfolio standards passed at the state level um, uh, and so on, we were able to, beyond those rifle shot descriptions of environmental markets, to create really what was the first legal characterization of what environmental instruments are as the thing. And we were able to do that as a form of what are now called intangible commodities. To be more specific, for environmental instruments, they're called environmental commodities. And an environmental commodity is not included in the swap definition. An intangible commodity is not included in the swap definition, and therefore doesn't have to bear 
the the burden of maintaining all of the you know collateral accounts protections positions you know policies and so on that if you're trading in derivatives you have to maintain <coughs> substantial cost um, you know impact um, and so these intangible non-financial commodities these environmental commodities um, basically are allowed to transact um, be physically settled and not regulated in the same way financial commodities are regulated. And in doing so, we basically saved folks operating renewable energy facilities, folks doing carbon projects, folks complying with regulatory flexibility mechanisms in environmental markets um, uh, around emissions trading and things like that. Um, we gave them the ability to go on without having to undertake a whole lot of additional costs to transact in those environmental instruments that they needed for compliance or that they were selling as part of their business um, from their projects um, that were originating them and so on. Um, and so, um, uh, as Daz is highlighting right now, we were able to demonstrate to them, but it took some time, that the intangible nature of these commodities didn't disqualify them from the forward contract exclusion that is available for commodities that can be physically settled. And so mm -hmm. even though they have corpus, they don't have corpus in physical reality, we were able to demonstrate that they can be physically settled. Um, and we did this both you know, in filings, but also through a number of meetings I helped lead with CTFC staff uh, and so on here in DC to help them really understand, you know, to show them registry records from environmental um, instrument registries, um, uh, you know, uh, contracts, examples of it, and so on, um, so that they got comfortable with it. Yeah, so great. And just one quick um, bit of, I'm just going to put a little salt and pepper on what you're saying right now. Um, so this is really <coughs> quintessential to one part of computational law, which is that when you have um, a legal instrument, right, that's legal, um, that, uh, or, or, or an asset, for like what a property is fundamentally a legal concept, and it's digital, you know, it doesn't have corpus in the language that Chris is using or, uh, or it doesn't have, you know, it's not, not like a tangible um, thing, you know, uh, like a table or a chair. Um, <clears throat> but that doesn't mean it's not real. And just to underscore this, as the economy and society itself transitions ever more into a digital footing, to like an information society, a digital economy, it's arguably just as real or more real in some ways. When I think about um, stuff I did in, uh, in government as a lawyer in the 90s, that was where the authoritative version was paper, like some of that stuff made it to the archivist. Um, a lot of it's gone for good. It was ephemeral. It was like, a, it was hardly real in a sense. It felt real because we could touch it. The few things I did that were, arc, that were, that were caught by archive.org and now propagated across, yeah. across servers, it's the only stuff I can find. Uh, and then when you have you know things that are maybe uh, enter on a blockchain or into systems that are, are verifiable or that exist across places or that could be you know updated for which is a kind of a chain of custody, uh, it, it could even be more effective for its essential purpose and more real legally than the stuff that was tangible and brutish and primitive from the past, arguably by contrast. So this um, so this breakthrough stuff that Chris was able to to lead. Um, in the past has now you know, resulted in our ability to, to really use this digital asset class of uh, like carbon credits in, in a way that, that has reality and that exists under, a, an, under an existing legal framework. You know, it's, hard, it's the opposite of far out. It's an, a, a perfectly well, you know, it's, it's a, a sound, you know, long-standing, well-understood legal framework of commodities regulation. And here's exactly um, how you construct, how, how this fits in the legal framework. And then, He'll talk a little more later, and so keep listening about how you can structure things like the credit. He mentioned like we could show him entries in carbon credit registries is something he just said like a minute ago, and a few other things. So there's artifacts and things which you can deliberately engineer in order to structure a legitimate system that falls under um, a given like regulatory or other legal framework. This is very good. This is how we practice law in the future and how Chris has been practicing it for decades. So back to you, Chris. And, and you know, the, the, this was, 
this was imperative, um, and, and you can read this in the, uh, in the Nature of the Thing um, article I co-authored in Environmental Finance uh, when all this was going on. Um, this was imperative because if environmental instruments fell within the swap definition, um, a, a significant percentage of their value um, would be lost to transaction costs for those projects um, that are using them to do non-recourse project finance. Um, and uh, it would have, you know, made a, 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 a significant and material impact on decreasing the amount of renewable energy, sustainability projects, carbon projects, and so on that were advancing because the value that they could get on the environmental instrument sale on the back end uh, was being, had to be, would have to be discounted because of the need to comply as if they were transacting in a financial commodity, which they're not. So this ended up with us creating this space um, for environmental commodities as part of intangible non-financial commodities. Um, and the, the reason why you know, this um, has value for digital assets is digital assets can look at the same manner and you can kind of go through the same structuring approach. Um, and, th and this really does bear on enterprise blockchain applications and since Liberty Mutual is here, I'll, I'll give you know uh, uh, an example of that. Um, if if Liberty, um, uh, you know, uh, an insurer or a reinsurer wanted to create a new market layer where they wanted to enable all of their policyholders to be able to trade increments of coverage intra year, you could use a technique I'm going to talk to you about now, um, uh, you could use a technique like that, um, uh, you know, facts and circumstances depending, of course. Again, this is not legal advice. This is all just conceptual exploration here. Um, uh, but you could um, potentially uh, develop a system where the enterprise blockchains, coins, and tokens that you were using to allow your policyholders within the year to, tra to transact amongst themselves increments of policy coverage, um, uh, all coming out of the same insurer, all coming out of the same reinsurer to a, a group of insurers, um, that could allow those customer policyholders to better manage their risks on the intra year through trading within that customer group ecosystem. Um, and what they're trading is basically a service currency that can, is serving a purpose that cash cannot serve, that represents and is exchangeable for a service, i.e. better coverage, you know, more coverage under my policy um, uh, 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 from an insurance standpoint. That's an example um, for how an intangible digital asset commodity could get utilized. Um, now, in looking at creating these service ecosystems around enterprise blockchains, um, uh, what I like to call the Chuck E. Cheese model of tokens, um, because everyone understands Chuck E. Cheese. You go in and the person running the service ecosystem, when you give them cash, they give you a Chuck E. Cheese token. And you can plug that token into the arcade, into the skeet ball to do whatever you want to do, you know, make the robotic mouse dance, you know, you name it. Um, actually, I think maybe it's a rat. I don't know. But the, um, the, the, the bottom line is that you can, um, under this kind of Chuck E. Cheese um, uh, example model for tokens and services and so on, you can, with enterprise blockchains, create these new market layers amongst your customer group um, that allows them to either through a bilateral transaction tree where they transact with you and then you provide to another entity or amongst themselves, but fundamentally allows them to create um, a, a market for increasing the policy coverage and so on. And again, there's not really a secondary market for this in the sense that it's not worth it to anybody other than someone who wants to exchange that service point and token for more policy coverage. Yeah. Um, back to the Chuck E. Cheese analysis, that Chuck E. Cheese tokens, um, those aren't being used to speculate. There's no Chuck E. Cheese executive who's holding 10,000 Chuck E. Cheese tokens that they're safe at home 
hoping that they're going to appreciate and so on. It is a service currency. Um, it basically exists um, to optimize the provision and allow more flexibility amongst the customer group for the provision of services, goods and services. So there are this concept of intangible non-financial commodities can apply to enterprise blockchains that are, are being put in place for, the, for business purposes, for, to optimize business processes. This is squarely different from the world of ICOs, Bitcoin, and so on, where you are dealing with um, tokens and coins that are really representing a currency that are, exist for nothing else other than secondary market speculation. Um, and to have you know, that, that, that trading market for people who are investing in them because they expect the value to grow, not because they plan to exchange it for any specifically determined, predetermined good and service you know, um, in the future. So I'm sure you're all aware after the ICO boom, well, during the ICO boom, the Securities and Exchange Commission came in and basically said, um, uh, excuse me, you guys are transacting investment contracts here. These coins, these tokens are investment contracts. And so when we're looking at enterprise blockchains, one of the first things you want to do is design something that wouldn't trip security status. Yep. Um, and the basic test that the Supreme Court has established for whether something is a security or not is a, the Howey test. Basic prongs of the Howey test. Is it an investment of money? Is there an expectation of profits from the person making the investment? Is the person investing money in a common enterprise? And do the profit that come do the profit that comes from that investment, does that profit source from the efforts of a promoter or a third party? So in many ways, think of passive investments, you know, uh, think of you know, stocks, bonds, all the other traditional securities, they all fit that test. Um, but also things like investing in the production of citrus groves, the, uh, the production of a worm farm, um, you know, uh, those kind of things can also meet those tests. And so when we were doing the ICO boom, um, what we had was the SEC, um, in particularly the dis digital assets transactions um, folks, come out and basically say, here's how we think the Howey test elements conceptually line up with what we're seeing out there with ICOs in the market and so on. And so they asked questions like, is the token creation commensurate with meeting the needs of users, like we're talking about with the Chuck E. Cheese model? Or rather, is it there for speeding speculation? If it's there for feeding speculation, it looks more like a security. Are independent actors setting the price or is the promoter supporting the secondary market for the asset or other, otherwise influencing trading uh, and so on. Well, we clearly see that with Bitcoin and all of the other coins out there that are trading speculatively and so on. Not so much for a service currency you know, ecosystem. Is the clear primary motivation for purchasing the digital assets for personal use or consumption? Well, under the Chuck E. Cheese model, under the enterprise blockchain model that we're talking about here where you're where the digital assets are going to be argued that they are intangible, non-financial commodities. Yes, if we're using them, if we're consuming them, that makes a difference. Um, but are the tokens being entered into purely for the purpose of investment, i.e. that eventually I'm going to exchange them for cash, that I have no intention of actually you know, receiving a service and so on. I'm just speculating. Under the model that we were talking about, the answer would be no. So okay. in the in the Can I ask a question. Sure. Uh, sorry, just a quick one. Um, so um, I, I'm with you so far on, on each point. Maybe partly because I've had the benefit of hearing you say it before. Uh, but um, on the so, as I understand it, part of what is um, needed to qualify, um, you know, something under uh, you know commodities law versus a securities law, um, is that uh, is that that unit of value is consumable. Um, and so the moment of consumption for a Chuck E. Cheese token 
is when it's um, like redeemed to play an arcade game at Chuck E. Cheese. Correct. Uh, the moment of consumption for a carbon credit, or we're more familiar, never having been to Chuck E. Cheese yet, uh, is be, is uh, when you retire the credit, I think. Um, well, when it's been retired is what it's called. It's no longer usable. So that ton of carbon that's been taken out of the air that's represented by the credit is is like, you know, done. It, it, someone's taken credit for it with a credit. That's what right. is the moment, what, what, what might, I understand we're just, you're doing a kind of a brain teaser here about, um, you know, you, about um, atomizing like contract uh, co insurance coverage and potentially pooling it in a way where people <coughs> could swap it. But would the moment of consumption be when you paid your premium and gained a like legal right to a claim under the under a policy or would it be when you've actually filed the there's been an event you file the claim or would it be when you, there was actual payout of the claim or that it was you know finally determined that you were or weren't covered or when when might just hypothetically the moment of consumption be under under like commodities law in uh in having like a a, a, a partial unit of an insurance claim yes so so think about it under the example um, uh, for the insurer or reinsurer creating a customer group marketplace that's run on an enterprise blockchain, um, the consumption of the tokens on that blockchain, um, which basically not too dissimilar to the way we do emissions allowances in a cap and trade system, yep. when you add up all those tokens, they would represent the full breadth of policy coverage to all of the policyholders in that customer group. And so they could trade within that customer group, but eventually when one of those customers, let's say they're entering into Q3, they know that their risk profile is increasing because of these various activities, they'd like to get better supplemental coverage. They could go out and procure basically, you know, tokenized coverage from another policyholder that is fungible with their policy uh, and so on that provides added coverage. And then when you had that risk event, um, that their policy coverage would be more because they've added to the tokens that represent that band of coverage. And so it would get consumed in the sense that if that policy needed to be called, that that person would have more coverage. Um, uh, it, it, it creates better risk mitigation and so on but at the end of the year, at the end of the day, um, or whatever time period was established by that insurance company, um, uh, those tokens would cease having value if they were in exchange. They just represent policy coverage uh, and so on, but they would need to be consumed um, you know, fundamentally um, when, they, when they get turned in that example. So um, also, this won't surprise you, one of the elements of what the digital asset transactions team at the SCA said, say, are, are the tokens distributed in ways to meet users' needs? You know, are they being transferred or held in amounts, you know, that correspond to the purchase or expected use? Um, or are they being really just held for investment? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're creating a service ecosystem, um, I mean, I have to check. I remember when I went to Chuck E. Cheese's, they had tokens, like physical tokens. <laughs> I, go into, I go into Chuck E. Cheese with my kids these days, and you get the card, right? You go to the machine, you put in your money, they give you, they load a card that you then flash and use with all the games and so on and, and such like that. Um, uh, uh, again, there's no, there was no buyout or liquid moment for the old Chuck E. Cheese tokens when they transferred <laughs> over. <laughs> Anybody who was speculating in old Chuck E. Cheese physical tokens, you know, it, there wasn't a moment of, of market crash or market spike or any kind of liquidity event for those guys when they transitioned, they ceased to, those tokens ceased to be worth anything uh, and so on. So well, when you're you can eight, see how you see having that. tokens distributed for actual use and consumption is an important element here. Um, are these, Digital assets, this is another element. Are they being marketed to the public? I.e. someone's Twitter account who's promoting the ICO generally versus are they being marketed potential users? Again, in our insurance example, it would only be available to people who are already policyholders. And it would just be a commoditization, you know, fungitization of those policies that used to exist as kind of, you know, customer to customer, block to block, but now we're allowing for the coverage 
under those policies to trade on the entry year. Um, and then finally, um, is the application fully functioning or in early stages of development? Um, enterprise blockchains tend to roll out for business purposes. Um, uh, they tend to have that central purpose once they, as they get going. Um, uh, uh, and this whole concept that I'm gonna create um, an instrument first, token coin first, figure out how it really gets used later. Now we've all seen a lot of that. That wouldn't fly under this and that would make it more likely, um, uh, uh, again, facts and circumstances depending, for the SEC to look at what you're doing and say that's really an investment contract, which is a form of security that you're selling with that token or coin. So the first step in doing structuring enterprise blockchain digital assets so that they can be used in your service ecosystem with your customer group or your peer group if you're talking about something that's being done in a sector, things like tracking the provenance of diamonds, for instance, where you have multiple companies involved in the supply chain uh, and so on. Um, if you're designing and structuring that enterprise blockchain, these days, the first step that you want to avoid is security characterization. Um, uh, and so that's something that, um, you know, you can do. Um, it's part of the structuring of how you design the governance for that enterprise blockchain and the transactional and contractual vehicles for how those coins, tokens and coins get transacted. Maybe that's buried in terms and conditions and other places, but you have to, it has to be laid out. Um, so if I'm doing this with an enterprise blockchain, the first, you know, pitfall to avoid is being, you know, characterized as a security. The next, next pitfall to avoid um, is, you will note before the SEC came out with their view of what constitutes digital assets and securities. The CTFC came out and basically kind of teased the issue and said, well, look, these we have jurisdiction over digital currencies. We have jurisdiction in addition to derivatives over digital currencies, foreign currency trading, and so on, because much of foreign currency trading really occurs at the derivative level. You know, it occurs through derivatives, futures, options, uh, and so on. And so, you know, one of the things that the CTFC hasn't really laid out in too much detail yet, they probably will in the future, is when maybe it's not a security or maybe it is a security, but do they also have either independent or concurrent jurisdiction with the SEC because they deem that thing to also be a digital currency? And when you look at Bitcoin, when you look at stable coins, when you look at where um, certain jurisdictions are looking in, taking the database system that their central bank look, uses and basically put that database system into a distributed database uh, and so on, there's an argument that, that the CTFC could, you know, could call their jurisdiction on the basis of we have jurisdiction over digital currency, foreign currency trading, all the rest of that, uh, and so on. But it's, it's not as likely. What's, what's more likely is if you can demonstrate that that service currency is consumable, if you can demonstrate that is physically settleable, settleable on the blockchain between the parties that are using it, that plan to consume it eventually, um, like Rex and Carbon Offsets, there's a very good chance that enterprise blockchains, tokens and coins, if structured correctly under the appropriate facts and circumstances and paper and all the rest of it, um, could be viewed not as a security by the SEC and as an intangible non-financial commodity by the Commodities Futures Trading Commission and therefore fall in the sweet spot of basically light to no regulation around the transactions for that, those tokens and those coins, that instrument. And what this means is that there's ways to structure enterprise blockchains such that they face very light-handed, if any, regulation over the transactions of the thing, i.e. the tokens and coins maintained on that enterprise blockchain ledger. Yes, so I, I think we're gonna go to a couple of questions now um, because we've got some people um, 
in the room who who have a few things. And and first, we'd like to bring up John, who's in the uh, who's a, another uh, human dynamics group member, and uh, also a lawyer um, from uh, Italy and doing work in doing his PhD in Dublin and now here for a little while. And so and sponsorizing. Yeah, 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 there you go. <laughs> Well, um, just uh, a quick, uh, quick comment back uh, to the uh, intangible goods. Um, it might be useful for any um, common law uh, scholar to consider that in civil law, we uh, exactly have this kind of uh, categorization. So, uh, and actually it informs uh, all our uh, private and contract law. So, for instance, uh, um, the um, intangible goods are a, a precise category uh, in which our reconstruction actually is a bit different because we don't end up uh, uh, to uh, consider them uh, um, material at the end of the, of the day, but actually we just uh, provide rights upon uh, the disposition of this kind of uh, intangible goods. Uh, so um, it's actually um, differentiation really simple. Uh, anything that is material is a material good. Anything that is uh, not material, so is untouchable, uh, is uh, uh, um, um, an uh, intangible. Uh, intangible. Uh, yes. Indeed, intangible comes from the Latin tangere, that is ta to touch. Uh, so that's, there we go. Uh, and there we go. just to connect to what I'm, I do, and it is yeah. also mentioned in the paper I wrote recently, um, data privacy in the GDPR and in Europe uh, works according to this, to this framework. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, I think, important to highlight. Interesting, and then of course uh, the um, IFRS, um, yep. uh, you know, standard for uh, accountancy uh, in in um, you know very popular in Europe is, does a pretty good job with intangible property and um, you know ownership. Um, in the U.S., in some senses, we're we're further behind conceptually with GAAP. You know, it's got it's, it's so much less coherent uh, treatment. Uh, so we, we, in some ways we may have some catching up to do. Well, yes, I, I would say that uh, the, um, the basic rules work different. So you don't have this kind of categorization because you are based on precedent that work differently. Uh, instead, we don't have the binding precedent. And uh, well, I would say that maybe uh, a common uh, a common thread is about uh, corporations because uh, the the legal nature of corporation I I'm not sure about the U.S. but should be let's say um, a corporation is intangible but it's uh, it's real because yeah. it, it acts and so on but uh, we um, is not uh, um, we'll say. Uh, is not uh, a good that you can own. You have stocks on it. Mm -hmm. And stocks uh, uh, represent rights that you can enforce upon the, the uh, corporation. So that is exactly the paradigm that we have with uh, immaterial goods. Mm -hmm. We have rights that we can dispose and enforce. So that might be yep. the, the common. And, and, and I think, um, through much of this, we are with intangible non-financial commodities. We're certainly talking about rights to make claims, to undertake an activity, uh, to exchange for a good or service, uh, and so on. Um, so you know, it, it certainly does line up, uh, you know, with rights. And um, uh, it's a great point. The civil law jurisdictions over in Europe, compared to the common law jurisdiction here in the United States and the UK, uh, and so on, do. Uh, do treat this differently, but also too, you have to be very careful. Uh, even the Uniform Commercial Code here uh, in the U.S. talks about general intangibles um, uh, in a way uh, that it constitutes personal property um, as opposed to um, investment property, letter of credit rights, instruments, you know, securities, and so on. You know, uh, mineral rights, that kind of stuff. 
Um, so there, the definition is important, um, but the good news, I think, is that, again, with the right structuring, there's ways that enterprise blockchain applications can get done without receiving securities classification and without being seen as a digital currency, um, uh, but rather as being seen as an intangible non-financial commodity, uh, basically what I refer to as a service token uh, and such. Um, and you know, the SEC and others said, you can't just call it a utility token and have it take on those characteristics. You have to, the way the, the, way the thing operates will either give or not give it a certain characteristic. Um, and, and that gets into the structuring of the governance of the system, the, the contracts that are used to transact, the terms and conditions, you know, and the rest of it um, uh, for doing so. But it's, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting approach, but, you know, uh, uh, rights, uh, rights and attributes from activities and so on can form into any number of different things, securities, commodities, interests, and others. And, you know, the, Basically, uh, the care and how you structure is important. Okay, and uh, next up we've got Bob. So uh, this is your Liberty Mutual representative here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think the use case that you put forth in the area of insurance, I, I think is certainly intriguing. Um, although um, I think it would make underwriters um, uh, want to take a lot of tums and uh, give them stomach pains. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and, when, and just so you know, what, what I've told the underwriters in the past is that they're um, like an admissions market where you say all of the power plants can only admit this many thousand tons of carbon dioxide. It, you tell the underwriters, guys, the overall policy coverage is not going to ever exceed this amount. We're just breaking up that total amount of policy coverage amongst the holders into more fungible units. Yeah. Uh Totally understand, and I think you'd have to have very similarly situated uh, you know, insurers or risks. That's right. If yeah, you, you wouldn't want to cross policy uh, line types for this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, um, I could just imagine a situation though where, and let's use a very real and, and very tragic example of what's going on in Australia right now with the wildfires, and you have yet to be realized or filed uh, fire claims or property loss claims. And someone who has more exposure in Australia, an insurer that has more exposure in Australia than another insurer could go out under your scenario in the market and buy reinsurance tokens. Well, that would be very unsettling to the reinsurer. You know, yeah. um, it's almost like adverse selection. So, but again, I, I love it. I'm not, you know, dismissing it. I'm just saying that there are some significant hurdles and challenges. Yeah, but no, I'll you, counter you with you an example. You have to have established established groups that you're doing with, and it's got to be really clearly defined so the underwriters don't um, uh, don't freak out and so that the reinsurers don't think that they've um, shifted the risk too dramatically. And there's, there's ways that it can be done such that the person running the enterprise blockchain, you know, the insurer, the reinsurer or whatnot um, is able to, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, take transaction fees every time it's transacted. There, there's manners in which it can be done where you can make sure that the risk doesn't uh, pool in a detrimental way to the issuer. Yeah, I, I, I think that that may be very true. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to maybe just offer up an example of um, uh, enterprise blockchain example that you're referring to for the group here. Uh, Liberty Mutual has participated in a proof of concept. I think we've backed away from it at this point, but um, there's a lot of friction in trading um, currency between insurance companies um, in the form of what's called subrogation claims, meaning yeah. one yeah. insured takes a, you know, a loss and we end up paying our insured, but they're really at fault. So then we subrogate back against that other individual, the tortfeasor, to recover the loss. And we're constantly exchanging these payments all the time. And it could be as small as a $500 payment for a bumper or a, you know, $200,000, you know, bodily injury claim. Um, and so there's been a number of insurers that have got together to try to tokenize the uh, subrogation claims or rights that you might have. And so to reduce the monetary friction, you would have an enterprise blockchain to then um, uh, essentially trade or aggregate 
the claims that you have and offset them against one another and so that you would have a period of time where you end up settling up yep. um, against each other. So if Liberty Mutual is better at, you know, identifying non-risky insureds than Allstate and, you know, we have a, a balance, a credit balance mm. uh, against Allstate, then we're able to claim that at whatever the settlement period is. And so uh, I still think that that will happen. Um, it, absolutely reduces the cost and friction. It is incredibly expensive. Just think about sending a check, okay? Um, you know, that is a seven to $10 event on top of the actual, on every single one. Yep. Um, so, you know, I, I don't need to get into like the economics of blockchain and all that, but I'm just trying to give a real world example of um, transactions between entities that have been tokenized and then you can kind of settle up and. So I, I don't know enough about, you know, kind of your theory here about whether or not that qualifies because then they're converting that to an actual hard currency yep. at some point, right? So you're not, yeah. I don't know that Liberty would trade its tokens to claim against Allstate to someone else, you know, yeah. uh, or anything like that because we're actually cashing them in for an actual cash payment. So I'm not sure that exactly qualifies under your example, but I think it's just a very interesting example of way that, organizations are identifying transactions and tokenizers are digitizing them in order to reduce friction or reduce costs. Beautiful. Yeah, no, that, thank you, Bob. That's, that is interesting. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you guys have, I'm sure the, uh, the group that's doing that has had council look at this. Um, but, you know, you'd look to things such as, you know, is it a limited group that has, you know, ultimate use to this? Um, uh, you know, can, in other words, you can't have anybody, you know, any investor come in and decide to procure those to speculate. Uh, they serve that specific purpose of um, reconciling subjugation claims. Um, uh, so uh, there, uh, you know, uh, there, there are some dynamics that go in the other direction because what you're essentially doing on those, with those tokens is um, uh, using them as a vehicle, a payment vehicle to come in and out of those tokens um, uh, as a uh, basically a more a, a cheaper a cheaper way than you know having to deal with Juliet accounts and all the rest of it, um, uh, but uh, uh, you know depending again how you do it and you know like, I'm definitely sounding like a lawyer here it all it all depends. Oh, oh, I'm so, I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, whenever you say it all depends, it's over. No, just kidding. I just want to say, <laughs> Todd, thank you for coming. Um, we're a little bit after the um, the normal hour. So appreciate it, uh, and uh, uh, I want to ask um, is if, or I want to say if there's anybody else that needs to go now because uh, we're we're um, 12 minutes past the uh, the um, witching hour. Witching hour uh, when we said we would end. You're free to go. Um, apologies for uh, for this being so darn good that we that we had to take more time. Uh, but uh, but it, but uh, you can come back and we, we will post this video uh, and we'll also do a wrap up email. Uh, giving people an opportunity to um, keep the conversation going in the Telegram channel, and um, if, if as uh, desired, uh, you know, we can facilitate um, some conference calls and things like yeah. that. And we do have this sort of cap off time at the end of January, which will we'll, uh, give you the final confirmed uh, date for when we can do some uh, little report outs from people that are um, participating in the course and uh, and have some discussion around that. So uh, with that, um, we're now going to enter um, extra innings. Um, and, uh, and can I ask um, Chris and, and others, um, would uh, like say 4 p.m. be a, an acceptable like new target for, for ending? Is that possible? Yeah, that works for me. I, I have a hard stop at four though. Okay, so let's go for like uh, 3.55. Uh, and, um, and so we've got um, two questions uh, in the batter's box, uh, Brendan, in the room, and um, and then something from uh, Alexandra from, uh, online. from uh, I think it was, I think Alexandra asked someone else online. Oh no, it's Chris's view. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, so we've got two online actually. I think um, yeah, one from Telegram, um, from Christina, uh, and then one from um, Alexandra. So Brendan, you're up. Yes, Chris. Uh, you uh, uh, first of all, I have to say it's great to see you again uh, from last year. Yeah, no, thanks. Nice seeing you too. Um, you made some uh, two, two really point, important points, um, and you know, maybe you can expand upon them a little bit more. First is that the 
nature of the transaction and engineering around it, it really defines what kind of a financial instrument it is or not. And yep. I think that, you know, really is a point that, um, you know, it really has to be driven home that it's, it's everything else around, um, you know, the engineering around all of these things. But the, 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 the other thing that I think that you really said, which was very important is, uh, and, and I want to make sure I have this right, is that it's okay if you have a, if you have a closed system, a closed ecosystem, it's okay to have a transfer um, from one person to another, as long as relative to the individual, that thing in question is consumed, although it may be transferred to another person, but overall, all the things in question are consumed, are ultimately consumed in ecosystem yep. over a period of time. So yep. at the end of the day, they're all worthless. That's right. And they, they need to be ultimately consumed. Um, and uh, the analogy to the renewable energy certificate market um, is both in the voluntary and compliance market, when you originate um, a renewable energy certificate, um, it has a certain shelf life. For, for the value to either maintain a, a voluntary certification or to be used for compliance by a uh, compliance entity um, in the compliance market. So, um, uh, you know, a, a use it or use it aspect, um, uh, the fact that it needs to be consumed to serve its final purpose, um, uh, to make a claim, to allow for services or activities to occur and so on. Um, that consumption aspect uh, is very important. Um, the fact that it can serve a purpose that cash cannot. Here's a question for you. It occurred to me in your statement, consumed, does that mean really consumed or does it mean that at the end of the day or end of a term that those uh, things in questions are just terminated, like in the ex expiration of all so, the at once. So, so yes, um, you can have expiration, and that that certainly helps to demonstrate that it's not, uh, you know, a, a financial instrument. It's not speculative. Expiration certainly helps, but fundamentally, it's the consumption wherein you use it for its purpose, and that environmental commodity, that intangible non-financial commodity, can there, after being used for its purpose, can no longer be used for the same purpose. It's, it gets consumed in the same way that, you know, you would take an agricultural commodity and, you know, take that bushel of corn and, you know, eat it. Um, uh, the same thing with, uh, uh, with environmental instruments, when they get consumed, someone is, you know, retiring them to make the claim that I've consumed this much green power, I've reduced my carbon emissions this much, uh, and so on, or they're being consumed to match up with activities that I wouldn't otherwise have been allowed to do legally without having a corresponding environmental instrument uh, as it is with the emissions markets. Great, great. Thank you so much. Cool. No, no problem. Thanks, Brendan. Um, great. So we've got a, a couple more. Um, one of, uh, just in, uh, oh, I already have a mic. Uh, in order of um, in and out. What is that? That's your yeah. telegram, I oh, think, telegram. through uh, okay. um, the uh, Christina has asked, and this may be something partly for you, Jan. Uh, uh, may I ask uh, about personal data sales? So th this was posed when we were going into the intricacies of uh, uh, the like um, civil law versus common law treatment of intangible property. Um, so the question is, may I ask you about personal data sale? Um, so personal data is another example. It's another um, asset type, you could say, of uh, intangible property. Um, and it says, what's your view? As you know, GDPR is interpreted as you shall not basically sell personal data. Recent EU directive says you can barter data for perhaps trivial services. Uh, what is your idea on this? Well, um, the GDPR doesn't say that we cannot sell our data. The GDPR is built upon the civil law, so it doesn't uh, uh, comprehend uh, the idea of selling data. Why? Because data are intangible uh, goods, and so uh, we have rights upon them. Uh, what does it mean? Um, 
personal data under the GDPR, or in general in, in Europe, uh, uh, belongs to personhood rights uh, because they descend uh, from Article uh, 8 uh, and 7 uh, of the Fundamental Rights Charter. So essentially, uh, we can license uh, uh, this data with our consent that must be informed, uh, um, unambiguous, uh, free, and so on to be valid. Uh, to the data co controllers. What does it mean? That uh, is a kind of contract uh, that is uh, um, bonded by the regulation itself. So it must align to those uh, strict uh, and imperative requirements. Um, but we can always opt out, for instance. So, um, for instance, we draw our consent that is you know, impossible to do in a normal contract. For instance, about data set. Well, um, the essential uh, example to understand the difference uh, in how we treat uh, uh, data not as commodity is that um, we have rights uh, upon the data, but uh, um, when we sell the data, when industries uh, transfer the data uh, between them, they sell uh, the data set meaning that they sell the uh, intellectual rights upon them. Why? Because a data set is a, a set uh, of a certain list of data, uh, and so whoever invented that list with that pattern, with that criteria, and so on, has rights, in intellectual rights, upon them. So this is what is sold. Uh, and we can, we should not uh, uh, misunderstood it uh, with, uh, for instance, if we have a pen drive and we sell it, we s the pen drive if the, is the material good, so we sell the pen drive, but the personal data and the data set that is uh, stored in the pen drive uh, uh, is not the good, so we have rights upon that. Okay, so it's not the good, it's, it, it's, a, it's basically IP. Yeah, yes. yeah that, and that's um, information, um, uh, 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 inventions, expressions, you know, that are represented, those, you know, the rights to control those inventions and expressions that are controlled, you know, uh, by intellectual property, defined by intellectual property laws and frameworks, um, uh, uh, you know, are, are separate, as is information, just raw information itself, data sets themselves, are separate from um, intangible environmental commodities um, in that intangible environmental commodities basically carry rights to make claims, either voluntary or compliance, um, or to undertake activities um, uh, in the real world. And they are consumable um, uh, you know, in furtherance of those purposes um, in a way that you don't have with information that can get used again and again and again um, or intellectual property that gives you the right to control who uses your, you know, how an invention or an expression gets used, licensed, and so on. So it, it is, it's different, but it goes to show how the various legal frameworks sometimes take very rifle shot definitions of things, especially in civil law jurisdictions. Uh, in other ones, it's really the definition of what you're not defines you. Indeed. And so, uh, so while we're getting um, jurisprudential up in here, um, that's a perfect segue to Alexandra's question. Uh, and so you, you could probably see it in the chat, but I'll, I'll read it. I, I wonder what uh, Chris's perspective is, it's Chris Barron, on how to harmonize the governance, you know, slash structure of uh, cryptocurrencies in light of their diverse national treatments. Uh, they are perceived in some jurisdictions as money, others as maybe a commodity or security. Um, in some places, it's like a personal property, the IRS has said. Uh, ultimately, um, is this even possible uh, to, to harmonize, uh, you know, the, 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 basically like the, the legal treatment of, you know, of, of these things? So, uh, I, great question. Thanks. And um, I, I think 
the ultimate harmonization is either going to happen in two ways. We're going to continue using the U.S. as an example. Down the track we're on right now where, you know, both kind of direct – the digital assets are getting defined when they fall in a bucket of a security or a digital currency, or as I've been arguing, an intangible non-financial commodity uh, and so on. Um, uh, uh, in other jurisdictions, it might be more rifle shot, but it's gonna be one of the, one of the two. Uh, doing a rifle shot, calling them out specifically um, uh, and naming them specifically would be a way that that could, could, get, could get reconciled, but um, from what I'm seeing, at least here in the United States, it comes into the way that you create, design, you know, use, transact, and consume, if you're going to consume it, uh, the thing, um, that will determine whether it falls in the bucket as basically just a digital representation of money, as digital currency, whether it falls in the bucket as a security, um, this is something I'm investing in, um, or if it falls in the bucket of an intangible non-financial commodity where it could be used essentially as, you know, service currency um, uh, uh, around, um, uh, uh, you know, new markets and so on uh, that could be created with enterprise blockchain op applications. So it's um, the, the governance structure of cryptocurrencies really has to lend itself to the core purpose of creating something that's being used exclusively and ultimately to be exchanged for, you know, the provisions of goods and services and so on, not something that is being, you know, used, transacted, and ultimately, um, uh, you know, uh, moving from database to database for speculative purposes. Okay, and, and I think we've got one final uh, vantage point uh, before we wrap yeah, we, up from, <coughs> from our Always a, a different yeah. perspective uh, about harmonization. Well, I would say that uh, uh, it's an issue that invests uh, either uh, uh, privacy, AI, I mean, all the technology because we are moving to a global uh, um, technological development, so we need global solutions. Um, there's no probably a right uh, answer from national uh, or federal laws. Uh, what m we might uh, think about uh, is to bypass the issue, um, considering uh, not the legal nature of the technology, but the technology uh, as a uh, uh, what it is, so to regulate the characteristics, how with the standardization. So uh, standardization laws actually have a neutral uh, approach to the technology. They just set the uh, minimum characteristics that something should have. And this might be uh, a path to do yeah. it. Indeed, yeah, so. Uh, uh, a point very well taken, especially from a, an attorney who practices in civil law jurisdictions. Indeed, yeah, and it, there's a certain like kind of logical axiomatic, um, you know, um, power to the answer uh, for how would, how would one harmonize across different jurisdictions? One would look for international, transnational legal frameworks. Yeah. Um, so at a high level, that it just uh, it's a hand and glove fit. And eventually you could have a, a treaty or another um, uh, framework, um, uh, you know, convention type document that that establishes, you know, what this looks like. But the from a U.S. perspective, um, again, um, investments in, in cryptocurrencies can often look like uh, securities. Um, uh, they can often look like you know investing in just basically digital currency, um, as it were. Uh, the IRS may treat them as investments, may treat them as appreciating personal property. There's any number of ways um, under different facts and circumstances that it, that it could get treated. Um, I'm uh, unfortunately not holding my breath um, uh, because this is a new type of, um, a new type of thing, um, digital assets, crypt cryptocurrencies, and so on. Uh, and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's come into a world where we've had long established frameworks to protect investors, um, to protect 
um, uh, industries, markets, and so on, um, in the derivative space, uh, and, and so on, um, uh, you know, from worst case scenarios. Um, and, uh, and that's where, you know, harmonization would be a nice goal, but I do think it's, it's a challenge. And, you know, there's, there's just such a wide strata in cryptocurrencies. And you'll notice that when I was talking about, you know, service tokens, um, you know, the Chuck E. Cheese model for enterprise blockchains, I wasn't calling it cryptocurrencies, you know, for a very specific purpose because they're not really intended to function as a digital currency. They're intended to function as something that allows for uh, folks to optimize the way that they um, procure and use goods and services. And that literally is the final word <laughs> on the topic. Uh, not, not because um, it's all that there is to be said, but really just because we're now at the, the final, final witching hour. So I want to thank you, Chris, again this year for, for sharing your expertise and your perspectives and for challenging us uh, uh, on, on how to think um, legally um, in this computational age. And I want to thank um, everybody else uh, who's, who's participated uh, Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and and what what do people need to know as we hang up? Yeah. So uh, we'll we'll be sending out a kind of uh, overview of challenges that uh, you know we've uh, come up with in the last uh, few days, so that we could so so as to you know kind of color some insight maybe into what we might be looking for you know as we get to this fourth day of the IAP computational law course where there will be an opportunity for everybody to present on some of the things that they've learned. So, you know, I'm sure some of the things that we'll talk about include uh, Judge Martinez's uh, hypothesization of what might an international court based on computational law look like. You know, I, I'm sure there's going to be uh, submissions um, for apps that are built in community that lawyer or a doc symbol. Um, maybe, you know, you want to just write up a, a brief overview of, uh, how one of these issues applies to something that you're working on and kind of provide your context to, you know, this uh, corpus of information that we've uh, kind of been accumulating over the last few days. Yeah. And like how might, how might you structure a system that could unit that could um, encapsulate units of insurance coverage or, or claim management uh, by, by uh, insurance providers uh, or carriers rather um, after the fact, or how might you construct, uh, architect a system uh, that's um, encapsulating some unit of value uh, in a way where it, where it could meet the criteria that Chris just walked us through and that are um, spelled out in more detail in the regulation. Um, and so that'll give us some, you know, some good food for thought. And the best part about day four, which will be the, we'll announce it, but tentatively January 24th, the end of January, is um, you'll be doing the teachings. You'll be doing the, the talking and the presenting, and then we'll be, um, uh, helping to facilitate dialogue and discussion and reaction uh, based on what you had to say. So we hope that you'll take us up on this offer. It is optional. Um, so, uh, but if you'd like to keep the dialogue going and then apply the learnings uh, in this way, uh, we invite you and encourage you to do that. So with yeah, that, yeah, with that uh, um, the uh, day three of like the regular class programming for the MIT computational law course is, fifth uh, annual hereby adjourned here's my gavel <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks so everybody. much to everybody for attending we uh you know we've really appreciated all the discussion and we're excited to see what everybody can come up with so stay tuned and please keep participating buongiorno